So, hi everybody. I'm Patrick from Berlin. Um, who else is from Berlin here today? Oh, just so few. To me, it seemed like everybody's from Berlin, but that's probably just like kind of my selective wahrnehmung, my filter bubble, so I notice Berliners. And I'm here to talk to you all about uh, side projects. So, who does side projects? Cool, yeah. I love, you gotta love side projects, right? Because you don't have any pressure to get it done. You can use any technology that you like. You can um, uh, figure out new stuff. For example, um, uh, the previous demo, I don't know if you were here, Gatsby.js. Damn, I have to try this out very soon. Okay, so, but what uh, to me, uh, side projects, um, one important thing is that it kind of uh, uh, allows me to move a bit out of the comfort zone. So here's a very, very scientific chart that I drew for you. I have some friends here in the audience who are psychologists, and they will probably um, confirm that this is highly scientific. So um, when I'm in my comfort zone and happily coding away at work, doing the same stuff every day, um, my learning is mm, not so great, right? And this is the unknown. Ooh, scary. So when I move out of the comfort zone, um, the learning goes up, and then finally, when I face the unknown, try out new stuff, um, figure out how to, how to solve a problem that's interesting to me, then I can tell the unknown, hey, let's be friends. Unknown says, okay, cool. So, um, this talk is about two things. Uh, Side projects, obviously, I already talked about, uh, started talking about this. And the other thing is a side project I did recently, which is using um, um, machine learning, and I'm going to go into a little more detail on that. And, um, but first, let's take a look at a couple of side projects that I did. So this is one that I did a couple of years back. This is kind of like a drum computer for children. So um, I have some, had, have some small children, back then they were even smaller, and I thought it wouldn't be nice to kind of have a tool that teaches them how a drum machine works. So this would be like 16s, uh, this uh, whole representation would be a, a one bar of music, and then there's this little bird flying that says when, uh, what the uh, position currently is. And if I start it, it uh, looks kind of a bit like this. Oh, I have to <laughs> push this start button, obviously. So as you can see, you can tap there and add little monkeys to change the drum that the machine is playing and figure out some stuff. And the, the little uh, kangaroo that comes out of the pouch of the mother was actually my daughter's idea. She said, I want to have a little child. Why doesn't the kangaroo have any children in the pouch? So what did I learn in this project? Well, I learned how to use the web audio API. Um, I watched an amazing conference talk about Web Audio API, and I thought, ah, oh, damn, I gotta do something with this. So this is how the idea came about. And another important thing that I learned actually was that I have limited time for my side projects. So when I started this, my head exploded. I didn't want to do just a drum machine. I wanted to do a whole digital audio workstation for kids that shows them how to make electronic music. And yeah, this has never come to pass because at some point, some other uh, idea is um, coming up and uh, this, it starts feeling like work, right? So when the side project starts feeling like your work, a lot of times I don't really follow up on this. And that's also a key learning that my, um, the time I have for side projects is actually uh, limited, and I have to learn to live with that and not be hard on myself for that. So here's another one that actually got finished. This was a game contest last year. It's called JS13K Games, and the challenge is to create a, a game that is only 13 kilobytes in total bundle size. So JavaScript, HTML, CSS, you can use whatever you like, but it's not allowed to be more than 13 kilobytes. So I learned a lot about optimization, about code golfing, about how to minimize everything. And obviously, you can't use any um, uh, bitmap graphics for this, so this is all canvas. Let's take a look at how it works. So the idea was you have to drop little bombs to avoid that a virus will get to the users in the network. And um, as you can see, the game is really, really hard. So another thing I learned that uh, if I have four weeks' time and I'm programming a game, 
I should make sure that I have at least one week to optimize the levels so the game is actually playable. Because I still think it was a pretty cool idea, but it's way too hard. Like the QA guy from our team actually managed to get to level three. And my, my kids did too, but just by wildly tapping it all day until they finally managed it. Okay, oh, let's try to stop this somehow. Great. Okay, so um, then uh, you might think, okay, games and, and uh, cute little music animations, uh, does this guy ever do anything that's actually useful? Yeah, this is a side project that I did that is really useful that I'm using today. And this is um, a project that is uh, synchronizing to-do lists. So in my daily work, I use two different tools to keep an overview or keep track of all the stuff that I have to do. One is uh, Evernote. Who knows Evernote? Oh, yeah, I'm surprised, yeah. I've been a first-time Evernote user, I love it. And I also uh, use mind maps to keep an overview. If Evernote had a mind map feature, then they, I would pay them twice the money I pay them now, but they don't, so I use a tool called SimpleMind, and that stores the files, the, the mind map files that it creates in Google Cloud. And I figured out a way, so it would be nice to have the to-do lists that are in my mind map synchronized with the to-do list that I have in Evernote. So let's see how this works. So here I'm adding a new reminder in Evernote. Do a demo for Evernote. I'm not really good at typing when somebody's watching, even if it's just a screen recording. And um, then it synchronizes, and this is like uh, the job that's running in Google Cloud Platform. And it sees, okay, I have a new to-do uh, that needs to be added to SimpleMind. This is the mind map program, and here you go. There's a new to-do item here. And then I can mark it as uh, checked. I did the demo for the mind map sync, great. And um, then, well, usually it syncs after a while by itself, but for this movie I made it uh, manually. And then you see that here, the to-do item is done. And I even hooked this up with Siri so I can grab my phone and say, hey, Evernote, I have something to do. And she asks me, okay, what? And if I tell it what to do, then it's going to show up both on the mind map that gives me a big overview of all the stuff I have to do, and in Evernote, which has a more structured view where I can organize my to-do items and add some little notes and stuff. So this is a... Um, um, project that's actually useful and I'm using today. And um, what did I learn in this project? Well, um, mostly how to use the Google Cloud Platform. Some people might be wondering why I'm not using AWS. That's because uh, I work at eBay and I'm not using any Amazon stuff. And we're actually also using GCP at work now. So I, th I thought it would also be nice to get familiar with the technology. Okay, so um, yeah, uh, now that I've mentioned work, at work we have a nice um, institution that we have that we call Innovation Days. It used to be called Slack Days, but at some point the managers thought, oh, Slack Days, that kind of sounds like the developers are just being lazy and slacking off, so let's call it Innovation Days. So the idea is that uh, for three days, developers at our company, eBay, by the way, if you haven't noticed, um, are allowed to pursue whatever they like to do, try out new stuff, do side projects, right? So, and um, after, at the end of these three-day events, which recur every couple of months, um, there's actually a trophy awarded to the team that has the coolest side project. And hey, notice this guy, this is me holding the trophy. And uh, what did I win the trophy for, you might wonder? Well, I did another side project, and this was my first time that I dabbled in machine learning. This is using a framework by uh, Google called TensorFlow. Who knows TensorFlow? Oh, yeah, it's pretty well known, yeah, of course. And um, another cool conference talk I watched at uh, JSConf last year, I believe it was, where somebody was showing that, hey, now there's TensorFlow JS and you can use TensorFlow to do machine learning in your browser or in Node.js, and I said, hey, great. And then I discovered that, yes, yeah, it's in its early stages, and you actually have to learn how to use Python for that. But, well, what can you do? I, um, Python, is pretty, uh, Python is a pretty approachable language, so I uh, kind of learned how to use it along the way, and I created this little thing. 
It's the Beitrags TÜV. We have a discussion forum for automotive um, topics. And there you can enter some text um, by some user who's posting in our discussion forum, Motor Talk. Something like, der Octavia Baujahr 2011 hat leider öfter mal Probleme mit dem Anlasser. And now my artificial intelligence uh, evaluates this and says, oh, that's a pretty good post, it's not, it's not shit talking. If somebody says, meine Karre ist voll cool, Alter, then the machine says, nah, that post sucks. So this is also um, something that we are kind of using in production, at least we tried. And um, we use this uh, for um, uh, schema.org uh, markup to uh, indicate which post in the thread has, is the best answer to be able to use FAQ so um, on Google we can be listed as an FAQ post, which gives us better search engine ranking. Okay. So this year, music software with Node.js. So, um, yeah. Really? Music software? We're an e-commerce company. What good will that do us? Well. To all those haters, I can just say, it doesn't matter. It's about innovating, learning, pushing boundaries, right? So why not? I mean, it's not, I, don't, I don't figure out new ways to sell cars better. I find out uh, new ways how to make music better, even if eBay doesn't, is not really in the music business. It's about learning, and it's about innovating, actually. So what did I learn during this project? I learned how to use real, uh, Socket I.O. for real-time communication between the browser and the server. I learned to lose uh, Yarn workspaces, which is pretty cool for organizing your code in a monorepo and uh, nicely separating each parts of your uh, code so you don't get a big ball of mud. I uh, learned to use some cool Node.js 12 features. In production, we're still on Node 10 because that's the LTS version. But for my side project, of course, I can use the cutting edge version of Node. And that would be worker threads, which was my initial idea to have like uh, threads running in parallel because music, of course, is very time critical. So you have to make sure that you utilize the whole, uh, all the processor power of your computer by using threads. And uh, private class fields, as an aside, also a pretty nice feature. And most importantly, I learned to use BrainJS to program neural networks. And I'll talk a lot more about that later. So a bit about the project. Actually, so um, when I don't know about you, but I work in an open plan office, and open plan offices suck, right? So you try to concentrate on uh, coding, and you need to find a way to drown out the office noise around you. So what do you do? Put on your headphones and tap away at your music, uh, at your uh, code, listening to some music or something else. Actually, I, sometimes I just use white noise or anything, and. Um, while I was, um, uh, so because um, I always try to figure out new stuff, how to improve, um, one day when I was listening to music, I thought, oh, I'm, I'm tired of listening to all the same old music all the time, and I want to try something new. So um, I also do make electronic music. Um, and um, I just had the idea of just turning on my music software and play some music for me while I'm coding. And um, this worked pretty well, actually. Um, it was just the same eight, 16 bars of music um, repeating all the time. And this was good for me because I need some repeti uh, repetitive background music. I don't want anybody singing with the lyrics that I listen to, but that doesn't help me to concentrate. I wanted something almost boring, but not quite, just relaxing and um, chill. So that worked pretty well, but then after um, three hours straight listening to the same 16 bars of music, I thought, ah, oh, no, this is, this is also not so great. So what can you do? Um, th this is how the idea came about to write, kind of write a program that would um, create a mix of this music automatically for me so that the music would just play for eternity uh, for as long as I like, and it adds subtle variations to the music so it doesn't get annoying in a way that I think, oh, I can't concentrate on coding because this is, the music is just too annoying. So I'm using a software called Propellerhead Reason. Is there anybody in the audience who has, knows what Reason is? Ah, wow. Hey, I'm surprised. Reason is um, 
as far as uh, music software goes, a bit like um, it's a professional music software, so there's actually hit music uh, composed, uh, created with reason. And um, you can do live kind of uh, these uh, cheap live performances. So this would be a mixer that has different channels. So the music is you have a bass and you have kick, tom, uh, some guitar sounds, percussion and stuff. And um, so you can kind of create uh, simple live performances by um, turning the mixer channels off and on again. So if I have some music playing here, the beginning, all these channels are red, they're all muted, as it's called. One is playing. And then, for after the first iteration of the loop, then we um, unmute some other channels. And you see how it kind of builds up the tension. It's kind of like an arrangement that's going on here. So you get the idea. So at some point, then the drums will kick in and everybody in the audience will go, woo! So this is basically very basic terms how you create a live performance with a music uh, software. So my idea was actually to um, write a Node.js server that would then control my music software reason with MIDI commands. MIDI is a, a standard um, for uh, doing just this. It's been around since the 80s. And um, yeah, this is an example for a very old synthesizer, which was the Prodigal DX7 from the, from the 80s that uh, you can hear on the radio today still, because every 80s uh, pop hit uh, has a DX7 in it. And it has these three jacks, MIDI in, out, through. And amazingly, throughout the last uh, 30 years, nothing has changed. MIDI is still the standard way to control music. So on my laptop, my music software is running, and it has like it doesn't have uh, actual uh, cables, but behind the scenes, it's sending MIDI commands to Reason to control it. And then I discovered something. Uh, my first attempt, um, I just said, OK, I will just uh, create like a random mix, and it uh, will turn the channels off and on again. And that was OK. But I discovered that letting the computer decide by random how to mix music gets boring quickly and produces unnatural results, actually. Yeah, I mean, at first you may not notice, but after a time, it got on my nerves again. So I thought, oh, yeah, I have to figure out a better way how to improve this. And um, so what's the secret sauce here? How can I mimic human creativity to comp create a compelling, interesting music mix? And the answer, you guessed it, of course, machine learning for the win, right? So machine learning, do you know in a nutshell what machine learning is? Who knows? Who doesn't? Who knows? Oh, yeah. OK. So machine learning. How can I use machine learning to uh, create an interesting music mix? So basically, how my software works is I have like this kind of robot DJ, let's call it that, the Node.js server that kind of creates a random scene, the combination of the channels that are supposed to be playing controlling reason by MIDI commands. The user, myself or you, are listening to the music, and then you can provide feedback. You can say, hey, I like this part, nice. Or you can say, nah, that sucks. And uh, then this feedback is stored in the database, and a neural network is trained uh, with that. And then the robot DJ can use this uh, to figure out what's a good combination of the channels to play that the users like. And then finally, the robot will be happy and play really nice music. So that's the basic idea of my project. And I called the project Zapperment. Please don't ask me why. The com domain wasn't taken yet. And uh, I always need a cute name for my project. So here you go, along with a mascot. And after all this talking, let's actually try it out. So if you have a mobile phone, I do hope this works. Uh, then please scan the QR code or go to Zapperment.rocks. Let's see let's, if it works on my phone. Because the Wi Fi here sometimes is not so great. Does anybody see the black screen? Hi, I'm Zapperment. Still loading. Yeah. 
It's the same thing that happened yesterday. The, the Wi-Fi is overloaded and um, you can't actually access it. Let's try it again with a, a second demo. So I'll just have to show it to you um, running locally on my machine. So if you were able to load the page, then you would have uh, something that looks like this. And uh, here's my uh, Reason DAW software ready to play. Here's my terminal with a backend that plays uh, the music. And um, the front end is already running. So it's two different, one front end part, one back end part. And I'll just go ahead and start. And here it was running. Oh, so actually somebody managed to connect. You can see that people are applauding the music here on the command line. Oh, a lot of it. So it does work after all. So you can provide some feedback and um, you can see what the other users, um, if the other users like the music that they're hearing or if they don't, right? And this is how I, this is all stored in the MongoDB database and then used to train a model to optimize the music. Okay, let's stop it again. So I realize I'm really running out of time. It's taking way longer than I thought. Um, but anyway, training neural networks. I'm using BrainJS. Uh, I already told you about TensorFlow, and I think BrainJS is less powerful than TensorFlow, actually. But it's much more easier for beginners like me to learn, so I highly recommend it, especially because they have a really excellent introduction video course where you can uh, uh, interrupt any time and edit the code samples there that you have on the screen. So this is really good for learning. And um, because I'm not really an expert on machine learning, I'm an expert on front-end developing. I'm a JavaScript developer, but machine learning is still very magic to me, kind of, yeah. So, um, very simple code example for training a neural network with BrainJS. Where is it? Here it is. And I probably have to reload this. Let's see. Oh, I'm surprised. Code Sandbox I.O. is working. Great. So, um, this is an example of the, the kind of uh, emulating the XOR condition with a neural network. XOR works in a way that if you give uh, it some, uh, two input values that are the same, it will say false. And if you give it two input values that are different, then it will give you true. So um, in um, uh, BrainJS, you always want to use numbers instead. So a false is zero, one uh, true is one. And this is my training data that I'm training my model with. So if I give it input zero and zero, I, uh, I get output zero, and so on and so forth. So the training data is used to actually train the model, right? Usually you don't have an array with four objects in it. You have tens, hundreds of thousands of uh, training data set, but this is like the most simple example that you can possibly have. As you can see, Brain works with out of the box with uh, stuff that makes sense, so you can add a lot of parameters here, but you don't have to. That's the nice part about it. And um, so here I'm training the model. Now the, uh, the network, the neural network has been trained. And then I can actually um, go ahead and do, um, what's it called, net.run. And give it some input value. So after I've trained it, I'm trying, uh, checking out if the model has actually learned that it should um, give the proper output value. Let's do a one, zero, one. So what is, am I going to see on the command line when I run this? One? Really? OK. Any other ideas? <laughs> Something like that, yeah. Clever. So when I'm running this, oh, sorry. It actually gives me 0 0.934. So you can see machine learning is not an exact science. It will never uh, give me one. It will always have some sort of error. So in this case, of course, uh, you would not use machine learning for this kind of um, uh, thing. It would be much, wouldn't make much sense. But if you have training data of, uh, that are in thousands, and then it makes perfect sense. Um, 
So um, when I was running the neural network, it's running through actually um, training uh, 4,000 times, uh, doing a prediction and checking, did I miss it or did, uh, did it work? So here in this first iteration, as you can see here, the, uh, there was still an error of 0 0.25, and it keeps on doing this, just kind of like a kid throwing the ball and trying to uh, um, hit the right spot. And after 4,000 iterations or something, it finally figured out a way to train its neural network to give a result that approximates the correct result. So that's nice, but what does it have to do with music? Well, um, instead of this very simple example, I can feed BrainJS pretty much anything. I can, instead of just arrays with zeros and ones, I can feed it something like this, right? So this would be a, an object that contains the different tracks of my music. That you, um, so when you were just hitting clap and boo, you were actually creating a data set like this that would say, okay, if I have the combination of the tracks like this, then I get um, so many claps and so many boos, and this is how the model is trained. And so if this is, would be my mixer, then um, the, these parts, these properties of the object and the data that I pass in correspond to the tracks on the mixer that um, have been playing when you provided your feedback during the first demo. Okay, time for another demo. Let's see if this actually works. And I'm going to go ahead and delete the data from my Mongo database. And I'm going to load another track in Reason, not save any changes. This is the second track that I created. So this is a different setup, and um, for the sake of this demo, I created this nice little synthesizer instrument that's called the Nervomat. The Nervomat has one key, it's this annoy me button. So we are going to try to train Zapperment to not push this annoy me button. Okay, so um, uh, do you still have this open? The front end is still running, you should see your back screen, let's start it. And please, when I start it, um, every time you, uh, you see that the Annoy Me button is red, hit the Boo button, and when the Annoy Me button is off, hit the Applause button. Because if you don't do that, you screw up my demo, it's not gonna work, right? Because usually you would have to have like 100 iterations until the train, uh, model is properly trained, but we are just going to, for, uh, because we don't have that much time, just go through a couple of loops. So this is boo, uh, no, uh, this is applause, right? Because it's not annoying. Annoy me button is not playing. At the beginning, this is totally random, the mix that it creates, right? Ah, here we go. Boo! I don't want to be distracted from work. What is this crap? Phone call or what? Are you kidding me? Okay, now applause. Woo! Great. Nice. Stupid annoying noises got uh, came away. Let's try maybe two more loops. Okay, this is still applause. Very nice. Nice little break going on here. Just some relaxed beat. Let's see if it's going to annoy me once more in the next loop. Okay, we can still applaud a bit. Yeah, that sounds nice. Nice background music for working. Okay. Okay, I guess uh, it hasn't actually learned yet. This is just coincident that it's not hitting the annoy me button because it will only retrain the model when I restart the server. Okay, well, I'm going to go ahead and stop it. I hope that the data we provided uh, is sufficient. So as you can see here, this is, these are the, the, um, the data that is actually being, st uh, the scene that it creates. And, um, so when I start again, it should train the model and not hit that annoy me button anymore. Let's hope it works. So far, so good. 
So this is just a basic example I'll show you. I made it slower because scientific evidence uh, indicates that if you have a slow tempo, it's better to get into the flow. It uh, stimulates the alpha waves in your brain. So, yeah, it sounds about right. So this is how I'm actually using machine learning to mix my electronic music to create smooth background music. So, um, if you want to be friends with the unknown, I hope my talk where I showed you some side projects was inspiring to you, and maybe you will do the next cool side projects, and I'd love to hear about them. So, um, that's it from me. Thank you very much for listening. And we have some time for questions, I hope, or did I take too, way too long? Oh, actually pretty good, 31 minutes. Uh, first of all, thanks for the very interesting talk. Uh, something that I've been always, uh, I've always had in my mind was how do you manage to have time for side projects with kids? I don't actually. <laughs> I don't really. Um, well, I, this project I actually started when I was on a, um, on a transatlantic flight. I was uh, traveling to, to San Jose, our company headquarters, and uh, they actually had uh, internet connection on board. So I'm, uh, I just started it there, basically, and then when I was jack -like working in the hotel. But back at home, I don't have a lot of time. So I had, like I said at the beginning, my brain was exploding with ideas of all the cool stuff. And of course, I had the ambition to tell you all, OK, this is running in the web, and you can listen to it at home. And then I've discovered how hard it is to actually get a real-time audio stream going. <laughs> uh, so that hasn't come to pass, actually, because if, if, if I were single, it might have worked out. So fly off, and, right? Uh, yeah, but I wouldn't recommend that because of uh, the carbon dioxide uh, emission. I try to avoid that as well. Yeah. Uh, can I seize the moment for, for another second question? Is, uh, sure. Is this project open source on GitHub probably? Yes, it is. Glad you asked. So if you scan this code, you get uh, straight to GitHub. And uh, it's the MIT license, and everybody is invited to join in. And uh, if you have um, knowledge on how to get a real-time uh, audio stream going with low latency, I would very, very much welcome you to work on this together. More questions? Combined with the drum computer for your kids. They yeah. Audio yeah, that would, that would be nice. Yeah, yeah. If you could uh, cr like create your own, if the kids could create their own track. And then that would be fed into Zapperment, and then the user feedback would give a, um, yeah, <laughs> that would be awesome. Cool idea, thanks. Yeah. More questions? All right then, thank you very much. Have a nice rest of the conference.